here and then of course to um, to to listen and and see the, the wonderful presentation elizabeth thanks yes uh, it's really a pleasure to welcome terry tonight uh, he has been a member of delta naturalist society for forever <laughs> i don't actually know how many years it is longer than i've been around and that's quite a long time uh, so i'm sure most of you already know terry um, I think most of you will have seen the newsletter and seen the uh, the bio and uh, the little bit about the presentation he's going to do tonight, but there are some people here who won't have seen the newsletter and some of you may not have a chance to look at it, so I'll just do a quick run through. Um, Terry's going to do an illustrated presentation on butterflies and some other bugs found in Delta. Um, as he pointed out in his recent Nature Notes column, while some bugs destroy crops and spread disease, others are really useful pollinating flowers and food crops. Bugs provide food for other animals, they help control plant and animal populations, and they break down dead things. <laughs> that sounds pretty ugly, but it's necessary. <laughs> uh, factors such as climate change, habitat loss, and insecticides are causing Earth to lose 1% to 2% of its insects each year. This is not really a good thing, considering they're pollinating our crops. So. Anyway, Terry obtained a biology degree at UBC, and then after ex traveling extensively in Europe and the Middle East, he returned to UBC to study ancient history and then librarianship. Now he's retired, but he worked for 32 years at the Vancouver Public Library, holding several positions, including reference librarian, head of a science division, and public service manager. As most of you know, Terry's been coordinating the DNCB outings for many years. And he also did our display coordinator role for many years as well. Um, he's a member of the Birch and Biodiversity Conservation Strategy Team. And I wish we could all say this whole name because we always call them just the Birch and Biodiversity Team, but that's not really what they are. Um, but the team has produced 10 outstanding Delta Natural Society service, uh, nature brochures, including three where Terry was a lead author. The Bugs in Delta, Butterflies and Moths in Delta, and damselflies and dragonflies in Delta. And all of the brochures are pretty wonderful. Um, as well as photographing birds, Terry's also enjoying photographing butterflies, dragonflies, and other bugs. If you haven't already looked at the September newsletter, please do so. You'll see a lot of wonderful photos that Terry has taken of bugs in there. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Terry and let him show us this wonderful presentation on butterflies and bugs. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Elizabeth. Now I think I can uh, share my screen here. So yes, I'm a member of the team that created the nature brochures. If you have any trouble hearing me, just please let me know. I volunteered to do one on insects. And um, let's get back to the beginning here. I volunteered to do one on insects, and I soon realized I wanted to include some species that weren't insects. So the brochure is called Bugs in Delta, not Insects in Delta. And I also realized that butterflies and dragonflies needed their own brochure. So there are three of them. and. Um, I've been taking photos of, of, butter, of birds for many years and a few butterflies. And now I'm addicted to taking bug photos as well. In fact, when I go on the weekly birding walks, I sometimes have more bug photos than bird photos. So the camera I use is the same one I use for birds. It's a, a Canon single lens, lens reflex, the ADD with a, a long, 100 to 400 zoom lens. So as I say, I use that for birds, but it's turned out to be good for bugs too. You don't have to get too close to them, which scares them away. And I don't like changing lenses. I don't have a macro lens. I'm just using this one uh, zoom lens. I'm not an expert, but I've learned a lot doing these brochures. And uh, I've also used iNaturalist quite a bit. And iNaturalist, you can use it in, in three ways. You can either, um, download it onto your phone and use the app to take a photo of, of plants or bugs or whatever. And it gives you suggestions of what those are. 
or what I do is I take the pictures with my camera, put them onto my computer, and then upload them to the uh, I know it's just website. And again, it gives you suggestions of what they could be. And a third way is you can have the picture on your, uh, your computer and then use the app to take a, a photo of the photo and see what it could be. Now, insects have three body parts. They have a, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And the thorax is where their six legs are attached. Insects have six legs and they have two antennae. Antennae are sensory organs for feel and touch and taste. So they can find the flowers for pollination and also to find a mate for, for mating. And um, the uh, butterflies and moths have four life stages. The egg hatches into a, a caterpillar, which is the larval stage, and they eat voraciously. And those uh, turn into a pupa or chrysalis, which is a non-eating um, non sedentary stage. And then the adult emerges from that. And an adult butterfly lives for about a month. And so our brochure shows you here the uh, plants that the caterpillars eat and the plants that the, that the adults need for, for nectar. So a good butterfly garden includes plants for the caterpillars to eat and for the adults to, to get their nectar. And you're probably all familiar with a swallowtail butterfly. It's the large yellow and black one. And in fact, there are seven swallowtail butterflies in BC and three of them in Delta. This uh, photo from the brochure shows you the Western tiger swallowtail with the tiger stripes and the pale swallowtail again with the stripes, but a paler and a wider band down the uh, sides. And then the third one, the anise swallowtail with, without the bands, but with, uh, with black shoulders. So this is a closer view of a, a Western tiger swallowtail. And as well as the black stripes, it has yellow and red on the tail. And same with the, the pale swallowtail. You can see the band is a bit wider. I've included a few photos from the brochure taken by other photographers. This is Jonathan's wonderful photo of the anise swallowtail. And um, again, with the uh, black shoulders, we often see these on the Boundary Bay Dyke. The anise swallowtail also has more prominent eye spots on the, on the tail, and that confuses predators. They're not knowing which way this thing is gonna move. Butterflies and moths have four wings. It sometimes just looks like two, but you can see there's a, a fore wing and a hind wing. And, Butterflies have slender antennae with little knobs on the end, whereas moths have uh, thicker antennae without the knobs and often quite feathery. And the other main difference between butterflies and moths is that butterflies are active mainly in the day and, and moths mainly at night. Now this is the cabbage white butterfly it's a butterfly, not a moth, and they are also very common, but also very beautiful if you look at them closely. Again, you see the uh, antennae with the, the knobs on the end, but the, the, the body is black and the wings are mainly white with charcoal on the edges. Females have four white spots on the wings, and males just have one on each wing, so, so two spots. And uh, although the caterpillars eat plants, the, the adults pollinate a variety of plants. So they, they are, are good pollinators. Now they are an introduced butterfly. They came from, from Europe. In fact, they, they were first found in Quebec in 1895 and they were in BC by the late 1800s. And uh, they've really gone all across North America. But as I say, they're, they're good pollinators. 
but all the white butterflies aren't cabbage butterflies. This is the margin white, which um, is named after the black lines on its, on its wings. And this is a pine white. They're found more uh, in, in the forest the, with pine trees and uh, other coniferous trees. The male has black on the ends of the forewings. And this is another view of a male with the, the black on the forewings, whereas the female has black on, on all, all the wings. This is a Sarah orange tip. It's a small butterfly. And the male has orange on the wingtips uh, outlined in black and with a black line at the bottom of the orange, whereas the female has white above the orange and doesn't have the solid black line. So quite often the male and female are, are different and quite often they're, they're the same. This is a, a cloud of sulfur, again, a, a small butterfly yellow. And the male has the black on the, the wingtips and the female has yellow spots within the, uh, within the black. Now, butterflies and many insects have a, a proboscis kind of tongue, which they use to, uh, to gather the nectar from the plants. And here you see, you can see the uh, proboscis. Another small butterfly is a cedar hair streak. It's called a hair streak because of this white line on the underside. It also has a little tail here, but um, it's very hard to find those butterflies with their wings open. You always find them with them closed. Another small butterfly, the Western Pine Elfin, is mainly brown with very zigzaggy decoration on the underside. Purplish copper, the male is uh, quite purple on the underside of the wing. They have uh, this orange zigzag line on the bottom. And the female is, is, isn't quite as purple on the underside, but does have the orange zigzag. Sorry, that was a male again, still with the purple. This is the female with the less purple. The Mariposa copper also has purple on the, in the male on the upper side, but the thing that really distinguishes them is the black and white um, along the edge of the wing, checkerboard. And the female, again, with the checkerboard, black and white. And we have a couple of little small blue butterflies. This is called the silvery blue. The male has uh, quite blue wings with a bit of black on the edge, whereas the female starts off blue and, and fades towards brown. And the, the way to tell the difference between these various butterflies is really the, the spots on the underside. So the silvery blue has this rather straight line of, of black spots. And there's the silvery blue again with its black spots on the underside. And this one looks very similar on the upper wing, but the spots you can see are, are very different. This is a neco azure. Our painted ladies are a little bit bigger than those. They're um, mainly orange and black. The painted lady has five white spots at the tip of the wing. And these are migratory butterflies. They, they really um, are resident in Mexico and the Southern US. But some years, they, when they're really plentiful, they, um, they fly northward 
and they come as far as, as BC, and we quite often see them, but by the time they get here in May, they usually look kind of tattered. And then they'll have a second generation in, in uh, June or July that'll look um, more like this. But they don't migrate back south. They, uh, once they've come north, they, they stay here and, uh, and eventually expire. But as I mentioned before, most butterflies live for about a month, but, but these, uh, these do live longer and, and can survive the winter. The underside, again, quite often you have to know the, the, the underside and the upper side to be able to identify the butterfly. And the male and female are quite similar. Now the West Coast lady only has four white spots. And this one, which is white, and the other lady is, is orange here. So, uh, and they also have brighter blue spots. I'll just go back to show you again. So there's the five white spots. And here are the four white spots with a, a more prominent blue lower down. The satyr comma butterfly has quite irregular wings. And again, the, the colors are mainly orange and, and black. And when it has its wings closed, it looks like a leaf. Many of these butterflies, when their wings are closed, they look just like leaves and that's to, uh, to fool predators. And there are a couple of other commas in BC and the comma always has this little white comma on the other underside of its wing. California tortoise shell. And again, when it's closed, it looks just like a leaf. The Milbert's tortoise shell has the yellow and orange band and, and blue at the at the bottom of the of the wings. The red admiral, mainly black with the orange and, and white. And there it is with its wing closed. Lorquin's Lork, admiral is quite common and uh, is distinguished by all these white spots. And to the end, fairly large. Not as large as the swallowtails, but uh, but fairly large. In our brochure, we've given the uh, the size. And with its wings closed, it, it still has the white spots quite visible, so you can distinguish it as a Lorquin's admiral. The morning cloak is another butterfly that can live for for a year. They hibernate. They are often found in wood piles or under bark in the in the winter, and they come out again in the in the spring. They're sort of chocolate colored with a cream colored edge and, and blue spots. And the underside is quite uh, quite brown. There's another group of butterflies called skippers. Skippers have very large eyes and their antennae have a little uh, hook at the end. This is a woodland skipper and it's orange and, and black. And they're very small. And here's one with its proboscis collecting nectar. Large eye, the hook on the antenna. And when, when they're not using the proboscis to collect nectar, they, they fold it up in a, in a coil.
Now the woodland skipper, the male, has a starker uh, stripe on the wings. So I, I said, this is a male. But you can see how small they are. They're the same size as a bumblebee. So I hadn't really paid much attention to these until I started photographing them. They're so small that you really don't notice them. But now, well, once you notice them, they're everywhere. Another skipper that we find here is a European skipper. So this is the second introduced butterfly. The other was the cabbage butterfly. The European butterfly um, also is introduced and uh, it's, it's more planar colored without, uh, without the spots of the woodland skipper. But they're also quite common here. And here you see with the proboscis coiled up again. And with the proboscis extended. And a third skipper that we get in Delta is the Arctic skipper, which is, has all these spots. And here it is with its wing closed. You can see the spots. So we have 32 butterflies in Delta. Uh, by checking um, iNaturalist and, and photographs of, of members and Anne Murray's uh, earlier book on, on Boundary Bay, where we found that uh, there are 32 butterflies, but there are many, many more moths. Now I was just gonna say the monarch butterfly isn't found in the lower mainland. They are, uh, they are found in the interior of BC. This photo I actually took in Hawaii and um, they are um, resident to, to Mexico and in the Southern US, especially on the East Coast. The ones that hibernate in Mexico, sit in New Mexico City, go off the West Coast, but it takes several generations, I think four generations to, to make it all the way to, uh, to Ontario. And milkweed is the plant that they, they their caterpillars need. And there's been a, a problem uh, with those all not being available to them. On the West Coast, um, they they winter in uh, in California and Mexico, but a smaller number of them. And as I say, they they don't come to the Lower Mainland, but they do come to uh, to the interior. So the monarchs are orange and the swallowtails are, are yellow. They're about the same size. Now, when I was in uh, California, I, I did find some of these wintering monarchs, the, uh, both in San Diego and in Carmel. And until you look very closely, you think they're just leaves. And they, they winter in eucalyptus trees, which aren't native to California, and which a lot of uh, purists want to to remove because they're not native, but that would be a disaster for these butterflies. But as you can say, if you if you don't look closely, you would, you would think those are just leaves. Now, as I said, there are many more moths in, in Delta and they also go through the, uh, the four life stages with the egg, the caterpillar, the pupa, and then the adult. And this is a white satin moth caterpillar. The um, North 40 is a place to see these moths, the white satin moth. In June, there seem to be many, many of them there. And you see the antennae are different than the butterflies. They're, they're very um, feathery. And you can see again, the four wings. The white satin moth also has black and, and white legs.
And we often see this woolly bear caterpillar. It's the caterpillar of the Isabella tiger moth. And they can live the winter. They can uh, survive freezing temperatures. So you often see them right through the, the winter when, uh, when it's not too cold. And uh, they become this Isabella tiger moth, which only lives for about a week. And in fact, doesn't, doesn't eat. The adult doesn't eat. And many moths have very short lifespan as an adult. They're more focused on, um, on mating than, uh, than so, but they do uh, pollinate. Moths do pollinate as well. And another one we quite often see are the tent caterpillars. With orange and blue spots, and they make the big tent in the, in the leaves. And they turn into this tent caterpillar moth. Again, you see its feathery antennae. And they only live a few days, and they also don't feed. And for a few years, we've had these outbreaks of lupra moths, hemlock lupra moths. This is um, the hemlock lupra moth, and there's a similar one called the phantom hemlock lupra moth. You can see the feathered antennae. They um, also don't feed, don't feed. So the adults are, are, are not a problem. They're, they're, they seem to be a nuisance flying around, but they don't do any damage. It's the caterpillars that eat needles of, uh, of deciduous trees. So this is a caterpillar of a hemlock looper moth, and it's uh, it moves in a, a looping fashion, which is why it's called a looper moth. So they, they're like an inchworm; they they crawl along and uh, in this looping fashion, and so they're also called inchworms. You can see the scale there beside a, uh, a, a Douglas fir. And one of the very large moths that we sometimes see here is the polyphemus moth. Again, these feathery antennae, but they're, they're very large and they have these large eyes that remind people of the Greek um, monster polyphemus, the one-eyed monster. So they call it a polyphemus moth. And as I've said before, having these uh, eye spots confuses predators. This is an unusual moth that we quite often get it at Boundary Bay and Blackie Spit and, and so on. It's one of the few that is active during the daytime. But you can see it's, it's also a pollinator. And it's a moth with its own feathery antennae. Another strange moth is the plume moths, which look like the letter T when they're resting. And uh, this is morning glory plume moth, but when they fly, they have feathery, feathery wings. Now, dragonflies you can easily see are also having a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. The thorax has the six legs attached. Dragonflies usually, or dragonflies do rest with their wings open. And they have large eyes that are touching and very small antennae. This is a, a blue, a blue darner, blue-eyed darner. And you often see the mating pairs of dragonflies and damselflies. This again is a blue-eyed darn, the male and the female. You see the female isn't quite the same color as the male. The male uh, attaches to the female's neck and the female uh, moves her abdomen up to get the sperm. And then they fly together to deposit the eggs. So you quite, quite often see mating pairs flying. And dragonflies seem to be hard to photograph because they don't they don't land very often. And when they but when they do land, they usually will come back to the same spot. So if you do, do see some landing, 
you can wait for them to come back. Uh, but sometimes they'll they'll hover, and uh, the camera will focus on them hovering. So this is a, a hovering blue-eyed darner. And this is a paddle-tailed darner. Looks like it's smiling. So dragonflies are older than the dinosaurs. They're um, carnivorous, the adults are carnivorous. They spend a, a lot part of their life as, uh, as larvae in, uh, in the water. So you need an aquatic environment for, for them. They, sp they spend many months as aquatic larvae. And then the adults, again, just live uh, a month or so. So you, you quite often find them around ponds. The, the pond at Diefenbaker Park, the pond at uh, Richmond, Richmond Nature Park are good places to find them. Now this is an innate spotted skimmer. Again, you see the wings are open when they're perched. And the, the male, has white spots between the black spots. And the, the um, mature male has the abdomen that's uh, powdery white, whereas the immature male has an abdomen that's black with yellow spots. But again, you see the, uh, the eight black spots and the male having the white spots between them now. Many dragonflies have this other little black spot on the wings. And when, when you're counting the spots on dragonflies, you don't count those spots, which is kind of confusing. So this is the eight spotted skimmer female without the white between them. But you'll see again this black spot. But it's counting the, the large eight spots for the eight, eight spotted skimmer. Now, this is a four spotted skimmer, but they're not counting these spots. They're only counting these spots. And the four spotted skimmer, the male and female are, are similar. This is a blue dasher with a mainly blue body and striped thorax, blue eyes and a, a white face. The common green darner has a green, a green head, a green thorax, but a blue abdomen. And it's a closer view. And again, you can see the, the eyes join. These are the eyes joined to the top of the head. The Western pond hawk is, is green with green eyes and black lines along the separating the abdominal segments. So photographing these bugs, you find that they really are beautiful. You don't really notice them until you look at them closely. This is the Cardinal Meadowhawk. It's completely scarlet red without any black on the abdomen. And it, it does have two white spots on the thorax. This isn't a white spot on the head, that's a reflection. So they're completely red with the two white spots. And this is a cardinal meadowhawk eating a lady beetle. And as I said, they're carnivorous. They eat uh, other insects. And 
this is a striped meadowhawk. Now there are many meadowhawks that are black and, and red on the, on the abdomen and different colored stripes and different colored face. Now this is a damselfly. The damselflies are usually smaller than dragonflies. They hold their they fold their wings when they're resting, and their eyes aren't touching. They're, they're widely separated. So this is a tulip bluet, a male. Now they have the blue and black stripes on the abdomen, but there's more black than blue in this case. Now this one, there's more blue than black. You'll see that's more black than blue, more black than blue and more blue than black. So there's a Northern Boreal and, and a Boreal, Northern Bluet and a Boreal Bluet. And they, the only way you can tell the difference is from their abdominal appendages. So you can't really tell a difference in the field. And they also are often seen flying together as a mated pair. And again, they more blue than black on the abdomen here. The female, slightly different color. Again, the male and the female, slightly different colors. And they uh, are getting ready to deposit the eggs. Another very common damselfly is this Pacific fork tail. It's got a black abdomen with blue on the tip, but the really distinguishing feature are these four spots on the thorax. And you really need binoculars to, to notice that, but it really is quite distinguishing the four blue spots on the, on the thorax. And the eyes widely part and the small antennae. And this is a female eating a gnat. So bees and wasps, like all insects, have six legs, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Now, after bee stings, the barbed lancet remains in the skin of its victim. When the bee flies away, its poison sac and stinger rip out of the body and the bee dies shortly after stinging. Wasps have a slimmer frame, a narrower waist, thinner legs, and they're often shiny and, and, and hairless. But their stingers are not barbed they're able to sting, withdraw, and sting again over and over. So you see they have the very narrow waist, but they're also uh, important pollinators. And many flies mimic bees and wasps. And um, you can tell it's a fly. It's, it has much larger eyes and very short antennae and only two wings instead of four wings. Now, when you're looking at a bee or a wasp, it's hard to, to see that those are actually four wings, but usually in the fly you can tell it's just two wings. And they mimic the color of bees and wasps um, to, to fool predators, but they, they can't sting. So this is a western honeybee. They've been domesticated for pollination and honey production. They're originally from Europe and they're um, again quite hairy with, with long antenna. Now, those are four wings, low. it's it's hard to tell that. And another honeybee, the, they collect the pollen and pollen sacs on their, on their legs. They take pollen and nectar back to the hive. We have uh, 32 native bumblebees in BC. Bumblebees are are very important for pollination. 
this is the yellow faced bumblebee. It's the, the most common one on the West Coast. It's quite large. It has a yellow face and uh, partly yellow thorax and a yellow stripe on his abdomen. The yellow fronted bumblebee. has a black face and black abdomen. This is a common Eastern bumblebee. It was brought from Eastern North America to the greenhouses for pollination. It's escaped from the greenhouses and is now quite common in the lower mainland. And again, it has a black face and a black abdomen and a yellow thorax. A fuzzy horned bumblebee covered with, with pollen. A black tailed bumblebee, or sometimes called the orange rumped bumblebee. And this is a mason bee. They're solitary bees. They don't have a hive like the uh, bumblebees and honeybees. They, the female uh, lays an egg and covers it with, with mud. They, um, they, don't, uh, they don't make honey, but they do pollinate. Now this is not a bee, it's a fly. It's got large eyes and small antennae. And in fact, it's called a bumblebee hoverfly, but it's just, it's mimicking a, a bee. It's a fly that's mimicking a bee. And that's another view of it. It's, uh, it looks very much like a bee. And this is another fly, it's a, a drone fly. It's a kind of hoverfly and hoverflies are the second most important pollinators after native bumblebees. So you can see it's got large eyes and small antennae and only two wings. And of course, I didn't know what any of these things were until I looked them up in my naturalist. European drone fly. Small antennae, two wings. Another hoverfly. Now here's a wasp with its narrow waist. It's a European paper wasp. And it um, has orange antennae. And those are four wings, but you can't really count them. Another view of the European paper wasp with its orange antennae. When wasps fly, they keep their legs hanging down, whereas bees have them folded in when they're flying. And they make this open honeycomb nest. And you can see eggs in that, in that nest. Now, this is a yellow jacket. It has black antennae. And uh, they make uh, nests, paper nests too, but enclosed paper nests, not the open ones. Another view of a Western yellow jacket. And you'll see that uh, I have, we have several different kinds of yellow jackets with different patterns on them. So you'll see those are black stripes. And this is a German yellow jacket with spots, with stripes and spots. This is a German yellow jacket. And you can see it's a pollinator as well. 
Do, do wasps have two wings? No, they have four wings. They have four. They have four, yeah. But I, it's very hard to see them as four. You see the very narrow waist, black antennae. This is an American sand wasp. It's a solitary wasp. We see them at Boundary Bay and Blackie Spit and uh, Iona. They um, have big green eyes and they make holes in the sand and uh, the female uh, lays an egg in there and she takes in flies to, to feed the larva and closes up the hole. And they're very important for keeping the fly population down. And they very rarely sting unless you actually stepped on one. They, they, they wouldn't sting. A mud dauber wasp is another solitary wasp who uh, makes an underground nest and collects spiders to feed its, uh, its larva. Very narrow waist, that one. And the thread-waisted wasp also has a very narrow wasp waist, and they um, also are solitary and make holes in the ground and, and take insects in to feed their larva. Hornets are wasps as well, but they're they're black and white. They live in large uh, paper nests as well, but they're uh, important for eating other insects mosquitoes and, and so on. Again, that's got four wings, but you couldn't really tell. But they're always black and white, the hornets. And lady beetles are very important for eating aphids and there are 500 species in the world. And many of them have been imported because both the larva and the adult eat aphids. And although they're called lady beetles, half of them are men. And this is the seven spotted lady beetle. It's an imported one. And this is the larva of a seven spotted lady beetle. They live for uh, about 10 days as a larva and then for about a week as a pupa and then they emerge as the adult. But they, they also eat aphids, the larvae eat aphids. This is an Asian lady beetle. It's got zero to 20 spots. And again, uh, imported. And its larva is very different. You see, that's got a, a stripe on it, whereas the other larva would have spots. And their wings are folded under the, the wing covers. This is an early morning photo with, with dew on the ladybug. And here's one of each kind. An mating pair. And with some twice stabbed stink bugs. Stink bugs um, make a, a smelly, uh, a liquid with a smelly odor to deter predators, and that's why they're called stink bugs. There are very, very many species of, of stink bugs. This spotted asparagus beetle is about the same size as a ladybug, but it, it eats asparagus, both the larva and the adult. And there's a mating pair.
And these are St. John's wart beetles, and they were imported because St. John's wart can be harmful to livestock. So they brought in these beetles to uh, try and uh, get rid of the St. John's wart. They're about the size of ladybugs. Very shiny. Western tiger beetle. And they eat other insects. Red soldier beetle. They eat other insects, but they're also pollinators. And the line June beetle, this is quite a large beetle and it's active mainly at night. And uh, the, the larvae eat needles of uh, coniferous trees, but the adults don't really cause much trouble. And this bandit alder borer has very large antennae. This is a, a ground beetle larva attacking an earthworm. So it's a, a, the larva of a beetle attacking an earthworm. And these water striders you can walk along the water and they eat mosquito larvae. The cell bug is one of the two kinds of wood lice that, that we have here. They um, are not insects, they're crustaceans. So they're related to crabs and lobsters. They breathe through gills. And the cell bug has little tails. These are the antennae at this end and the tail at the other end. And they can't roll up into a ball. Whereas the pill bugs and other wood lice um, doesn't have the tail and it can roll up into a ball when it's disturbed and they don't do any damage to living plants. They, uh, they're part of the composting process. They're an important part of the composting process. And here's a, a centipede, which also isn't an insect. It doesn't have six legs. It's got, in fact, uh, 15 pairs of legs. They eat other insects. And a millipede with uh, 30 pairs of legs, yellow spotted millipede, and it also um, eats other insects and, and can release a kind of cyanide, black and yellow spotted millipede. Carrie, if they're not insects, not being a scientist, what are they? A bug? Well, I'm calling them bugs, but they're arth arthropods. Arthropods, okay, thanks. Yeah. And spiders are not insects either. They have eight legs and two body parts. They're arachnids. This is a cross orb weaver, orb weaver which makes um, these large webs to catch insects. And it, uh, it, it's named because of the sort of cross shape on its body. And um, if the insect gets caught in the spider web, they uh, then wrap it up in silk and, and uh, keep it for eating later. And these little black and yellow spiders are baby uh, cross or weaver spiderlings. So um, they're all together in a little clump and if you disturb them, they, they spread out and then um, will come back all back together into a ball again when, they, when you've left them alone.
This is a banded garden spider with a grasshopper. Again, it's got it in its web. A goldenrod crab spider can change its color depending on what plant it's on. And it is called a crab spider because it can walk sideways or forwards and backwards. And it um, doesn't uh, make a web, it just sits in the flower to catch uh, other insects. It has eight eyes. Most spiders have eight eyes. You can see them right here at the front of the head, eight eyes. Two body parts and, and eight legs and fangs. Now this, when I took a photo of this skipper, I didn't even see the spider that it was eating, that it was being eaten by. So that's the goldenrod crab spider attacking a skipper. And I didn't even know it was there until I, I, took the, I looked at the picture. So that um, concludes my photos here. I'm just going to unshare my screen. So as I said, I'm not an expert, but I'll try to answer any questions if you, uh, if you have some. I, I have a question. First of all, excellent photographs. Excellent. Um, it's, it's really quite amazing how beautiful insects look when you see all the details, many of them anyways. Um, but I was wondering, do bumblebees live in hives or are they more independent? Some live underground, but they're, they're, they live in hives, but some underground and some not, but in hives. Okay. There's, there's one thing on the chat thing here. Um, oh, Laurie Schneider is saying that the photos are stunning. Oh. And she's right. The photos are absolutely incredible. Thank you. I um, see some of these things around in, in the garden and in the park, uh, but you know, until you see the photo, you don't get any idea because you can't. You know, they move around so quickly that you can't see them right very well. And until you see the photo, you, you can get a really, really clear picture of every part of the creature. And some of them are quite beautiful, actually. Yeah. Gary, um, if you catch a butterfly or a moth, sometimes you kind of have uh, dusty stuff on your hand. What is that, a powdery sort of covering on their wing? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but... Uh... Um, sorry, I'm, I'm just interrupting, I guess. Uh, there seems to be uh, many more different kinds of spiders that you find other than the ones that you've shown, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, many more. There are, I think, 200,000 200, bugs in BC, so I, we only got a, photos of a few. You know, it's quite amazing, though. But the, the spider I always found fascinating is a jumping spider. It's a yes. tiny spider and hunts other other insects and jumps on them. Yeah, well, there, there are a few of them in the brochure. So Pam, you had a question? Can't hear you. you Pam, yeah. Um, so I learned um, a, a couple months ago, I guess, that bumblebees pollinate through something called sonication. Do you know about this? That they hum a middle? Oh, okay. Oh. Well, I was going to ask you, but I guess I'll tell you. <laughs> I don't really know much about it, except that they, the, one of the reasons that they're considered a superior pollinator of blueberries, for instance, with their bell shaped flowers, is that bumblebees hang upside down. They do this a lot. You've probably noticed this. Um, and they emit a middle C. They hum the note middle C, <laughs> and the pollen vibrates off onto them so they don't have to like penetrate the flower with their tongue um, or get at it with their head they just can be on the outside of the bell and they hum this middle c it's called sonication anyway and and it the pollen falls onto them and this is why they are apparently six times more efficient at pollinating uh bell shape you know things like blueberries um and for all i know many 
other flowers uh, than domestic honeybees, which don't have this capacity. And it's one of the reasons that they're considered so very important in Delta, where there's so many blueberry and cranberry uh, fields, mostly okay. blueberry. I think. Right. Anyway, I was just going to ask you if you, <laughs> if you knew what you knew about that, but uh, that's all I know about it. But I, okay. I thought I would share it anyway. Okay. Thanks, Joanne. You had a question? I did. I just wonder what would make a difference? Like there's one butterfly that dies in a month and another one or a couple of them that showed us that hibernate. Yeah. Now, wouldn't want every butterfly want to hibernate and live a bit longer? I'm just wondering. Yeah. Well, I, I don't. I don't know why, but some yeah. butterflies also have two or three generations in, in the same year. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. so they, they live a month, but they live a month, but the, you know the next generation also lives a month, and so they're around for several months. Yeah. 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 Fascinating. Thank you. There's a couple of other comments here. Joe Stevenson saying, great talk, Terry. Uh, Mary Savage, very beautiful photos. And Laurie Snyder, what was that word again? Sonic, sonification, I think you said, right? Pam? I, I, I always want to say sonification, but I think it's just sonication, sonification. but I'm not sure. I, will, I looked it up because I thought it was sonification and then it wasn't, or else the other way around. <laughs> It's either sonication or sonification. I think sonification is a different thing than sonication. Okay, so something for us to all to look at. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Just, I just wanted to make a comment about photographing insects because like Terry, it's become kind of a thing for me the last few years, um, mostly inspired by our brochures. But I just wanted to throw out there, like don't dismiss your cell phone as being a fantastic tool for taking photos of insects. Like you, like most of the pictures I take are with my phone. I use the zoom function with the camera and those photos are usually good enough to put on iNaturalist or to try and figure out what it might be through other means. Um, so don't just, you know, don't think you need to have like fancy camera equipment to take pictures of insects. Um, because your phone's probably going to do the job pretty well. Hmm. That's right. And some of them that you get quite close. Yeah, they're not as intimidating as, you know, some of the big lenses. I never thought of that. <laughs> Audrey? Okay. Pam, that was absolutely fascinating. Middle C. That's incredible. Um, yeah. Terry, I wanted to ask you if you have any idea about how many types of wasps live in the ground, um, which I discovered, unfortunately, when I was gardening, I didn't even know they were there until I was stung. And there was a big hole and a whole bunch of them. I don't know how many. But, hmm? I don't know how many, but a lot of them, there are a lot that live underground. And even some bumblebees live underground. Okay, thank you. Well, I didn't know that about bumblebees. I did know it about wasps because my late brother-in-law almost died a lot sooner than he did because he was working in the garden in Kelowna and uh, dug up, um, I think it was mud wasps and got stung and he was uh, highly allergic. <laughs> but I've, I've had lots of bumblebees in my garden this year. And I think it's partly because I bought this um, vermilionaires to attract hummingbirds. And those, that plant really does attract hummingbirds, but it's also got bees on it all the time. And sometimes the, the, some of the bumblebees are so big, they're almost as big as the hummingbirds. <laughs> Crazy. I also got stung by a bumblebee that was uh, nesting inside my composter. And I went in to dig out some compost and it flew straight out and stung me in the face. And I had a great big <laughs> lopsided face for a while. So I guess anywhere there's a nice place that's quiet and lots of sod or, you know, soil, they'll hibernate in there, I guess. Right, Terry? I think, yes. Anyone have more questions for Terry? I have one question. <laughs> the, <All> um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the what was it you mentioned? It was a bee that lives alone. Um, the uh, what do they call them? Anyway, I can't remember the name. But 
you can buy these little homes for them, which are a series of tubes. Yeah, the mason bees. Mason bees, that's it. Um, do they always find a natural tube or a natural hole? Is that how they live? And they don't live in hives, you say? That's right. They, they will find some other hole, but, uh, but it's very popular to to make nests for them, and uh, but they, they they make their own as well. Notice that they sort of or something sort of stuffs grass that you know when they use one of those tubes, they stuff grass or something in the end of it. And mud, and mud, yeah. Jim Jim Rombach, can't hear you. Can't hear you. You're muted, Jim. Can't hear you. Need to unmute yourself. <laughs> Press the space bar. Looks like he's got an iPad. I don't know how you unmute an iPad. Weird. We can't hear you, Jim. I, I can mute people. I can't unmute them. Hi there. I got you now. Yeah. I got you now. I've had uh, honeybees and bumblebees in my garden, especially around and oregano plants. What I was interested in knowing is if they make honey, does it taste like oregano? Well, I, I, they do sell honey with blueberries and different other plants. So I think it does, it does take on the taste of where they're getting the, the pollen from, the nectar. Okay. Um, we bought, yeah, we bought some um, honey from Crete that was called um, Oak of chestnut, and it's very dark in color, and it does have a different flavor. Right. Mm. See, it's a comment from Audrey as well. Thank, excellent presentation, Cherry. Very interesting, wonderful photos. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. So, any more questions, comments? No. Okay, well, I'll just there's a number of things on the chat there, Elizabeth. I don't know if you've gotten to them all. I think I did. Yeah. I think I, I, think I got them all. Jim, you had another comment? No. Are, are some of these uh, insects endangered? Yes, many, many are endangered. Okay. And is, there, is that effect of man or climate change or both? Well, lots of things, climate change and habitat loss and insecticides and uh, many, many things. And are the numbers going down? Yes. Yeah, the Earth is losing one to 2% of its insects every year. Oh, wow. It's kind of interesting. Scary situation. As the insects go, the birds lose food. So it, it does affect also the bird populations. Well, that too, yeah, of course. Say nothing of the crops and the food that we eat. <laughs> so, okay. We're, we're, toast. <laughs> we're finished, you guys. Yes, finished. That's right. Insects go, we're toast. That's the way it works. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that's probably it. Thank you so much, Terry. That was very, very interesting. And uh, okay. you're, you're actually getting me interested in bugs, which <laughs> I never thought would happen. But <laughs> I have to have started looking and, you know, and I was sitting in a friend's garden one day and it was one of those eight spotted skimmers. And <laughs> I said, oh, I think I'd be an eight spotted skimmer. You know, have you got one of our brochures? <laughs> Yes, she did have one of our brochures, and yes, it was an eight-spotted skimmer. So, yeah, so it's um, it is nice to have the brochures and and to start having more of an interest in things besides the birds and the plants, which interested me before. So, thanks again, Terry. Okay. Um, our next meeting, as everyone should know by now from Sid's comments, but some of you weren't there earlier, I think, um, is our October fourth, and it's our annual general meeting. And our presentation will be quite different. We will not be in Delta. We will be in the Amazonian rainforest. And David Hoare is going to be doing a presentation on 
uh, his adventures in the Amazon, which included cruising in the treetops because the river was 50 feet above its normal flow. So it's going to be a very, very interesting presentation. Fish swimming through the trees, eating fruit. <laughs> I think we're gonna see a lot of things we've never seen before. And some, most of us will probably never see. So anyway, don't forget AGM. Think is about the zoom? name in the hat for, <laughs> is that a zoom for meeting? other than a calendar. <laughs> is that a Zoom meeting? What was that? Will that be, will that be a Zoom meeting or? Uh, we're not 100% sure yet, Jim. Okay. We're still hoping, we're still hoping that we can get a hybrid going. And if we can't get a hybrid going, we'll have to see which way it goes. Uh, how many, you know, we want as many people as we can possibly get for the annual general meeting. So we'll have to see what looks like the best bet if we can't make the hybrid work. So we'll let everybody know as soon as we have a better idea. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll say good night to everyone then. Look forward to seeing you in October. And you, Joanne, I hope you'll be back again.